Good evening, I'm Michelle Martin, host of Tell Me More on NPR, and tonight I'll be your moderator for this very special program, WHUT's American Graduate Community Town Hall. Today in the U.S., more than a million kids drop out of high school every year. This is an expensive problem. Estimates are that this costs our country more than $100 billion in lost wages and taxes every year. Right here in Washington, D.C., where we are now, less than 60% of students graduate on time. The unemployment rate for D.C. residents without a high school diploma is more than 22%. That's just another of the disturbing numbers that helps us to see that this is a very good place to talk about this national problem. But we don't want to just talk about the problem. We want to talk about solutions. So today, I'm joined by educators, community leaders, students, parents, caregivers, and more from around the Washington, D.C. area and suburban Maryland and Virginia. All care very deeply about this crisis and are here to share their stories and their best ideas. WHUT's Community Town Hall is part of the American Graduate Let's Make It Happen, a public media initiative sponsored by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. We've gathered here at WHUT on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C. for the next 60 minutes to hear insight and ideas. Our conversation about change begins now. Here in the studios of WHUT with NPR's Michelle Martin, WHUT's American Graduate Community Town Hall. Let's make it happen. Hello everyone and welcome. So we all know what we're talking about, but I want to hear why. Why is this happening? And this is a good place to start the conversation. We don't want this just to be a, a pity party, but we do want to hear your ideas about why is this crisis continuing? Who wants to start us off? Um, hi everybody. I think my opinion, um, I'm a community leader here in D.C. Um, I've been working in the community about 13 years uh, with some of the hardest to serve populations from ex-offenders to uh, average youth, obviously. Um, and the thing I see is that the education problem truly, especially in the District of Columbia, is far more than an education problem. It's a problem about, um, you know, there's a lot of focus on rebuilding schools and putting money into the education system, but it's not enough money and resources put in rebuilding the family structure. I think that's really where, because if you look in, um, for, for instance, uh, Banneker High School has about 100% graduation rate, and Cardoza has about a 38% graduation rate. They're about roughly eight blocks apart. But the, the families of the student at Banneker and the family of the student at Cardoza is wholly different. Could, could you give me an example of a, a particular situation without giving names, obviously, sure. of something that comes to mind that causes you to give us this, this th that informs your ideas about this? Okay, well, um, I'll use my own personal um, experience, right? Um, I come from a community, impoverished community. I come from Hanover Place here in the District of Columbia. And I'm, my father was in prison um, during a life sentence. My mother, um, you know, had her own issues. And I went to Gonzaga College High School, uh, which is the majority of the population there is uh, affluent. And um, I saw firsthand the difference in, in between. They had people at home that could help them with homework. They had models that they can follow that went to college that not only graduated high school, but obviously went to college and started businesses. All the kind of things that you see, two parent households, um, two professional parents. And I didn't have that, right? So my, my, my route or my trek to uh, where I needed to go was, was had many more barriers and challenges and I, I wasn't unique in in this in the sense of having those issues in the community I came from mm -hmm. all of us were like that so okay. that's what's happening today in the District of Columbia and I think all over the country as it relates to um, who's successful um, or who graduates co uh, high school and who does not. Okay. Well thanks we're gonna come back to you later and you can tell us more about what do you think made a difference for you and by definition what might make a difference for other people who else who wants wants to jump in already the, the, the ice has been broken so I'm uh, Jerome Dances. I'm actually a retired professor of mathematics from the University of Maryland. And I, I'll, I'll start by quoting the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Education, who said that the, the reason why children lose interest in math and science in, in middle school is that many of the teachers do not know the math and the science. And now, of course, the question is, why? Uh, and, and the reason is that the when the states or the district certifies middle school math and science teachers, they don't, do not require that they know math and science. Can I, can I push you a little bit on this question? Because uh, some kids have, some students have told me that one of the reasons that they're not interested in some of these subjects is they're boring. They're taught in a boring way and they just can't, they don't see the relevance to what they need to know. W what do you think about that? Well, it, it is boring and that's because the textbooks are boring and that's because the 
the writers of the textbooks do not know how to, to make them interesting, and also they don't know the math and the science. And, the, and the, the districts and the states do not require that textbook writers know the math and the science. And the same with other subjects. But mm -hmm. We've done some previous conversations, I think right here, with, just with teachers. And they had a lot of ideas about this. You know, I'd be particularly interested if there's anybody here who had been on the verge of dropping out or had dropped out himself or herself and wants to share. Okay. I haven't been on the verge of dropping out. Um, like my gentleman over here, I grew up in a two-parent household. My parents were working class. But when it comes to science, I, may, I minded in chemistry. Science is fun. It depends on if teachers actually do interactive activities based on students' learning styles to engage students. I graduated from Howard University. My point is, science is not boring. Science is very fun when you do interactive activities to actively engage students. I'm also a principal. And I understand that we have to, I understand the whole dropout process. We have to engage students. We have to actively engage students based on their learning styles. Can I ask you to reflect on what this young man said, though, that he feels that a lot of it is what's going on at home, where uh, kids don't have the support, and it's a personal, it's stuff going on at home, it's personal stuff, as opposed to what's going on at school. Thoughts on that? My thought is that I agree 100%. I grew up with both my mom and my dad. I had a grandmother, I had a great grandmother. I grew up in a very stable household. And kids who don't have stable households generally live in influx. And so as a result, they don't get the foundation that they need, which is why they come to school with so many problems. And then many times parents expect the educators to handle those problems. Always, what does the school do? What, how can the school help me? And there's lots of things that as a principal, I can't do. Because I, it needs to be at, at home. It needs to be at home. Sir? Well, to touch on the, the home situation, I noticed I sat in my little cousin's class, and their teacher had to spend 15 minutes to get the kids to behave before they could even get to teaching. So it definitely makes a difference, the, the rearing at home. Also, I think the teacher, some classes are, there, there are too many students per teacher. And the teachers are extremely underpaid. I mean, you're not really motivated to do your job when you're not getting paid that well for it. So, we do want to talk about resources, you know, at some point, and maybe we'll move into that soon, ma'am. Um, I think it kind of goes both ways as far as what she said with starting at home and also what he said with um, kids having a person to talk to. Um, my experience, I'm from Chicago, and our culture there is a little bit different um growing up i was in a two-parent home um and school was really important to me but the kids that i went to school with picked on me a lot because i was really into school but for whatever reason i never let it bother me and i remember just continuing my love for school and my love for education um when i got older my father was incarcerated when i was in high school and i remember it was me and i have three other sisters and each of us dealt with it differently, but we all were able to graduate high school. We all went to college and things like that. But I remember um, looking back on it, I, I'm like, oh, okay, you know, wow, I have a master's, I have a bachelor's degree. And I that's really unique because I remember just being in high school and not having someone to talk to about the fact that my father was incarcerated. And I really think that's something important when it comes to, you know, situations like me and him where – the idea of having a parent incarcerated really carries a lot of weight. That's hard for a 13 or 14 year old to deal with. And it goes beyond the kids to carrying around so many things sometimes that, you know, I couldn't talk to my mom about my dad being incarcerated. That was her husband, but that was a conversation that we couldn't even have. And I think that as a community, as um, a society, that there should be more resources available to kids to encourage them to be able to express themselves because lots of times that's what ends up prohibiting them from being able to graduate or be able to flourish in education. What would that look like? Um, a conversation. I think that was a major part of what I was lacking, just someone to simply feel comfortable and express myself, um, not knowing how to deal with the emotions that I was going through. The, You know, you're missing a parent, you're missing a part of you, you're missing a lot, and just simply having someone tell you it's okay to talk about it 
was really, I think that would be something that would really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with the social worker at the, the high school where I work today. And one of the things she shared with me is that the students um, are not being served. Now she um, works especially with students who have um, 504 plans and IEPs. And those are, for those who don't know. Yeah, 504 plans um, indicate that a student has some kind of health disability and an IEP is an individual education plan, which indicates that there is some other kind of um, impediment to learning, um, maybe dyslexia or, or anything, a bipolar disorder, something like that. Um, so that is the population in our school that she serves. Um, but she's, she indicated that um, they are really excited to come into our office and speak with her because, one, they get out of the classroom where we have 90-minute blocks. Even when I was a sub, I couldn't stand being in front of a class for 90 minutes. I thought that was far too long, especially if somebody has a medical disorder mm -hmm. or some emotional disorder or anything. They need a break. So they get put out of class um, or they just leave class and then they're in trouble. And so we're suspending them, we're sending them home. And sometimes the homes that we're sending them to are not places where you know they need to be. They need to be at school escaping that sometimes. Yeah. Um, and then we're expelling them. But we keep asking these students to come in and be in this classroom and, and, and be normal. Um, and again, they're not being served. And another way in which even our quote unquote normal students are not being served is that a lot of them have desires that um, we're not meeting. For example, yeah, biology is great, it's interesting, but if you want to be a cosmetologist, well, I, don't, I would say you don't really need that. And even our brightest students, our valedictorians and salutatorians, want to do hair and nails. They want to be music producers. If I had to characterize it, I would say that some of them fall in that W.E.B. Du Bois camp, and some of them fall in the Booker T. Washington camp. Most of our kids are falling in with Booker T. Washington. They want to do something. They want to be something. They want to be somebody or something that you can put a name to. Mm. I'm a firefighter. I'm a police officer. I'm a funeral director. I'm a nurse. I'm a cosmetologist. I'm a music producer. But when you say, I want to go to college and study biology, well, what does that mean? Mm. What will you do? Thank you all for the ideas that you've thrown out so far. We have a short video clip to share with you. This clip was taken from a conversation about some similar concerns raised in a panel discussion following the screening of American Promise. That's a program that's also airing on WHUT, and it chronicles the story of two young African-American men who are attending a very prestigious private school in New York only to learn that even in some of the most affluent environments that there are obstacles to success for some students. I want you to take a look at this and then we'll talk about it and tell me what you think. Some of this was mentioned, but developing these community partnerships where you have community-based organizations and other organizations that support children and families, but who are organized around the school, mm -hmm. both in terms of the academic success as well as their social and emotional well-being. But having all these things, but that takes resources, it takes yes. funding. Um, and so having that kind of dedicated funding, there's, there are some efforts now that are being supported by the federal government, but it's still early. Uh, mm -hmm. Early in the sense that there's not a full kind of government commitment to it, there's not a full appreciation, I think, throughout the country that this kind of approach, organizing, organizing communities around schools is really effective. Having summer enrichment programs, having college readiness programs, um, extracurricular activities, some of the basics. So let's talk about that for a minute. He threw out a lot of things. In fact, it was a, a big kind of list of things, but I'm interested in how you all react to those things. I mean, are any of you working in out-of-school time programs? Here, come on, in, come on, in, come on in. And can you do you mind if you tell us sure, who you are? No, my name okay. is uh, Jason King, and I'm with an organization here in D.C. called Turning the Page, and we engage parents to become more active and effective participants in their children's education. And I think we heard here on the clip and before during this town hall that the idea of engaging parents is really important. I think in terms of resources, although it's often listed, engaging parents is one of the biggest challenges facing our schools. is often the last priority. Is what we focus the least amount of resources on. Parents, we've seen, want to be engaged, but it, there's a lot to handle in terms of helping the children make those decisions so that they can enter college and beyond. And so for us, we feel that it's really important to invest a lot of resources and make it a priority to engage the parent. And I think in a middle school level, when a child is deciding whether to drop out, to have a parent 
that has been invited into the school, that has provided information. It's a lot of testing, a lot of letters that none of us, even as educators, have trouble understanding. And we assume parents should understand it. And so I think that we don't often take the time to say, how can a parent be really engaged and understand what the challenges are and understand what the opportunities that are there for their children? Other thoughts? Other thoughts? Sir? Um, can we know who you are? Oh, my name is Malcolm Clapper, and I work with a nonprofit called Gapbuster. Uh, we work in Montgomery County and PG counties. And the biggest thing I heard from him was that there needs to be a community around our children. Um, even though I know it would be great for every single parent to be able to spend time with their children doing homework, I have a couple children who parents love their children, work with their children whenever they have a free day off work, are with their children. But in the times where they are working and they are doing double jobs, you know, it's good for their parents, the kids to be able to come to a place like our center in Riverdale to be able to get help or homework. Or for even the parents who are from, you know, just immigrated to this country and don't really understand the college application process, having people there who have been through that process and who have been through that process with other kids who are not their children, being able to sit with the parent and the child or just the child itself, himself, you know, and work with them and see, all right, cool, this is what, this is what a, a resume is. This is what uh, you're, you, you need from a recommendation. Mm -hmm. You know, communities need to be built around our, our students. So, so what does the world, according to you, look like? If, if you had everything you needed to do what you want to do, what would it look like? All right, so the world, according to Malcolm, <laughs> would be <laughs> when a child leaves the school, even if he's going home or going to, you know, a community center, there's some place for that child to be, to be great, to be able to express and be exposed to things so that that child can know, all right, not only am I going to school, to get this degree, but I'm going to school because this is where I want to see my future like, and these are the things I need to do to do, get to that place. And that comes from being able to see that future. You know, you know, a lot of children, they don't get a chance to see what their future could be like. They don't get to see real life examples of people who look like them, who are doing the things that they see themselves doing. And if they can see that through their community and see that through the people who are around them, that, that's, that's the world according to Malcolm. Other thoughts? Hi, I'm Maria Berry, and um, I just was listening to the comment from the clip, and I, uh, I absolutely agree around the out-of-school time. I mean, those hours are equally critical to what's happening, the six hours of day that are in the school, and I feel very similarly to the, a lot of the other comments, um, that we need this public will and the collective will. I mean, here in the District of Columbia, there's actually been a $44 million decrease in funds that were given around out of school time and summer programming since just from 2012. So if we're really gonna move the needle on this, we really need to have a better um, system put into place around tracking the opportunities around a cohesive strategy for what this uh, scaffolding will look like to get kids through the whole system, which is inclusive of the day during school, but then it also includes summer and their out-of-school time. Talk to me a little bit more about that, though. Could you make the connection for me, but what is it about the out-of-school time that is critical to keeping kids in school to finishing? Sure. I mean, I think it's it's the soft skills that, quote unquote, and it's this, this social skills that you get. So it's the non-academics that often are the things that are cut first from budgets in school settings, whether it's art or dance or music or even science, um, which I would not call a soft skill. I don't think any of these are soft skills. I think they're equally important. But those things are things that kids can connect to, can raise confidence, can build I mean, so much of success is not about the grades that you received, but it's about how much have you retained and how you process information and your confidence and your ability to work with other people. And that, that's what really matters. And a lot of the out-of-school time programs are structured, um, quality out-of-school time programs are structured exactly like that to be able to fully engage kids, meet them where they are, not have the clock ticking in terms of, you know, some test that needs to get taken or some bit of information that has to get, you know, learned in a certain amount of time. And people have that ability in these out of school time programs to do a lot, a lot more of those, those activities. Sir, did you want to engage on this question too? Uh, I just wanted to okay. add on to what she was saying. I, I am, am a founder and director of an organization here in DC called Guerrilla Arts. We do curriculum development and ed consulting, but we more importantly have after school, out of school time programming where we recruit, train, and hire artists, local artists to work in the schools and in these youth programs with students to, from everything from capoeira to mural painting to DJing to music production. And I see that, 
you know, there's a genuine interest that students have. Now, mind you, if you do an 8 to 3.30 school day and then you walk into our program at 4 o'clock ready to go, there's a genuine excitement that they have to, to get involved and to do what they have to do. And I think for a lot of students, even if they feel um, marginalized or not, not where they should be in school, in the school setting, I think um, these after school programs and, and programs like this give them an opportunity to have that outlet to interface with, with actual artists and people who do the medium that they're trying to do. And, um, and it just, it, it kind of adds more balance to just teaching to the test, studying to the test, doing homework. What's the secret sauce of your, of your program? Is the secret sauce that a kid, a person, a young person, can connect to something that interests him or her? Or is the secret sauce just the attention of another adult that he's on the same wavelength? What's the secret I sauce? I think it's both. I think, I mm -hmm. think it's the fact that if you, for example, say, I want to learn how to be a DJ, the fact that you can actually interface with an actual DJ and learn it is one part of it. But then the other part of it is the quality of artists and people that we bring in, they genuinely care about what they do. And I think that's an unspoken thing. That's you know me telling a student I care, I care, I care does nothing. Is what is what my actions mm -hmm. tell that student more than anything. So, iron sharpens iron. You know. Yeah, exactly. This lady's been waiting patiently, and I don't know. I'm gonna get into you because I know you're gonna get in this conversation very briefly, if you would. Yes. Um, I'm in the educational system here in D.C. public schools, and I think that parents should be uh, buying into some of the programs that their kids are are involved with. Uh, becoming an active partner with their child, uh, being able to train with their child, because a lot of parents are liking in a lot of skills uh, and not able to help their, their children. So I think if they become actively involved, that they would, would buy into it more. Okay. Well, let me play this clip, because this is a clip that is also from the American Promise discussion. It talks a little bit about the challenges faced by parents. A lot of people have been talking about parents. I want to get your reaction to this. Here it is. Mm -hmm. I'm a product of a New England boarding school. And the very reason that I helped the university open the middle school was because of this one question that I had when I was in school in Andover, which was, why is it that for black children to be able, or children of color to be able to get a phenomenal education, mm -hmm. almost um, by very definition, they have to travel outside of their community to get that education. Now, we always have folks that are called uh, ambassadors within our community that are going to do that because that's their spirit. But whether it's here in D.C., whether it's going west of the park or actually traveling to another area to go to a boarding school, that to me uh, speaks volumes of the failure of the educational system in our country. The, um, when uh, Shagun's father said in the opening when the mom and dad were going back and forth of why he was going to Dalton, and the father ultimately saying, you know, I want my son not to go to a, a New York public school because of my own experience in New York public school. Uh, again, we see that this point that parents of black children struggle with, I think more so than anywhere, because in this day and age with folks having gone through the civil rights movement and us making many, many gains, one of those questions that face middle class professional black parents is how do we educate our kids? And there's two questions that are asked that have to be answered. One, in an area where they're getting a phenomenal education, and two, where they're getting that education, where that underlying education, that cultural education is one that respects them, one that empowers them, uplifts them, especially when we're talking about from preschool all the way through, because it's not just the book knowledge that we're getting, but we're getting all of those intangibles, that voice that we talked about. We're building who we are as individuals to be able to excel and succeed in this world. So. I'd like to talk about this whole question of the role of the parents. And ma'am, I'm going to come back to you because you raised this question of kids being, um, or, or there needing to be activities that the parents could also be involved in. I'm betting that some parents will listen to that and say, I'm already doing the best I can. I am already running on empty. What else do I have left? What else do I need to do? And I wanted to ask if you could you react to that. Yes, I could uh, give an, a perfect example. Uh, one of my sons attended the Howard University Middle School of Math and Science, and one of their um, commitments was for parents to sign a, a form that they would participate at least once a month 
or twice a month, depending on their availability. And I thought that it was a very effective program because the parents was there learning what the kids were doing and they were involved, act, involved as active participants. And I just think it was an effective way for the parent and the child to learn at the same time. But you know, you were saying that a lot of parents really feel dissed in the school environment, right? So how do we square up those two ideas? Can I think that parents, when they see a contract or they see something that says, please be involved and here's why, they jump at it. I think that often schools and teachers are so busy doing what they're required to do that the idea of engaging parents is more difficult. And so I believe, and I've, we've seen evidence where parents who are invited come out. Not only that, what's really important is helping parents develop a network because parenting is very isolating. And when you say that, in your example, I'm running on empty, I can't do any more. What they're also saying is I'm alone. And when we bring parents together and enable them to network with each other and learn from each other and understand that they all have something valuable to add to the conversation, to their own kids and to their fellow parents' kids, they're going to be empowered and they're going to be more engaged. They want to be there. They're going to have fun. They're going to high-five each other when things go well. And they're going to be together because I think that if we don't enable parents to get together with teachers to think and talk strategically about to help their kids, then yeah, then they're going to feel this. Well, other thoughts about this? Other thoughts about the whole pa pa parent question here? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Connie Horn, and I do teach for DCPS. And what I had discovered is when I first started, I was teaching at a cooperative play group. And we had parents come in every single day. And it was a requirement that you actually came in and you helped at the play school and added you know to the community in uh, in that play school and then you get to the elementary school level and it sort of fades away and that's not something that we should allow to happen Oregon has actually um, started uh, cooperative schools where regardless of the grade level you know, I th and I believe it goes all the way up to eighth grade in Oregon that parents are asked to come in at least once a month into their child's classroom and participate. That does require that uh, the teacher have something for those parents to do. But, you know, if you just put a little bit of extra time into designing your program, then you can get those parents into the classroom and they can be really effective. Other thoughts on this? I'm going to be here. I'm going to pretend you're in the first row. Here, I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> I think that part of it is understanding that you have to meet parents where they are. Um, for me, my daughter goes to school in Montgomery County. I work downtown. So for a one-hour conference in the middle of the day, it requires an hour to get up there, an hour to get back in the one hour. So it's really three hours out of my day. Um, but her teacher has done a good job of being available after school. So she has conferences up until 7.30 at night, I think. Mm -hmm. So I just think the understanding that um, you may have to meet parents or call parents outside of the normal school day her teacher also will make Saturday morning phone calls, which I appreciate. Or it's understanding that some parents are quick with email, but really slow to check voicemail. Just trying to find different strategies to reach parents where they are. Siobhan Campbell, and I'm with the DC Trust here in DC. Um, I often do feel like there is something going on between parents and educators. It's always us versus them at times, right? So what I find out though, is when you're with the child, you have to make a connection. I'm gonna introduce a new element. I went to school, therefore my mother went back to school. So what happens when you do a good job when you're with the child so that they go home because you formed these connections and they take it home and then they inspire their parents. So I think that that's not happening a lot. For example, you do need biology because if the person wants to be a hairdresser, there's chemicals that you put in a person's hair. You know, aerodynamics, you got a car. Children love cars, they love the sleek look of it, they want to be fly. TV, you got the camera crew who's behind it. No one's forming the connection. Math and science are people who love music. Dance are writers, expression. No one's forming these connections with their, when they're with the children. Anybody else want to talk about this? The reason I say this is that I remember, you know, a lot of people back in the day, you know, teacher and parent were one. You know, you, you would be, it was a question of who to be more afraid of. Now, I don't know that that was necessarily 
you know, the best thing. But now it seems that parents and teachers are often at odds. Now, sometimes that's because people have a different sense of their own standing in the conversations that they may not have had X number of years ago. Other, other thoughts about this? Do you want to participate in this? Go ahead. Yes, my name is Mark Irving, mm -hmm. and I run a culture enrichment program in D.C. And one of the things that I find um, the hindrance to children is they are limited, even in school, where what we actually do in the program is we believe in exploiting the natural resources of our community. And a lot of the kids, they are so limited because they're just in the community. They don't even take the advantage, or some of the parents or some of the schools doesn't even take the advantage of a lot of the museums and the monuments. And one of the things is to get the kids to get inspired. Education should be inspiring. You know, it should be energized and exuberant, and that's what's missing for a lot of the kids because they don't actually see themselves in the picture well. They don't see themselves going beyond that five block, ten block radius. Hold that thought for me, if you would, because I, I want to come back to that. You all filled these out, right? Before you came in here, there were sort of surveys about uh, talking about sort of your ideas about here. I just want to read this clip, and then I want to hear your comments about that. Uh, and this is, this is a little bit D.C. specific, but a lot of uh, school districts around the country are now offering parents a lot more choice and families a lot more choice. And this is one of the comments that, that, that one of you made. I do believe that the structure is now too complex. Parents might have many more options than in the past, but when you have a situation where some schools are receiving more resources compared to other schools, there's a lack of equal opportunity that should be available across the board. So let's talk about that. Do we want to talk about, does that, does that resonate with anyone here? Does that sound like a situation? I see some nodding heads here. Okay, go ahead, Matt. Hi. What, I, uh, what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues is that programs are started in their school, but then the funding doesn't last or student test scores have dropped. So, oh, well, you're losing that program because you're not, you know, getting the kids up, you know, to the right test scores. And I, I think that's not the right way to do it, in my opinion. You know, if the test scores are dropping, maybe the program needs to have, you know, more of a push in that school instead of taking it away. So I do see, you know, that there's no equal list of what does a pre-k classroom look like what does a second grade classroom look like what does a 10th grade biology classroom look like you know it should look the same regardless of what neighborhood you're in hmm. other thoughts Mary? Mm -hmm. go ahead you want to talk okay go ahead mm -hmm. i meant to say my name is jackie muhammad and i work with a group um in dc called girls inc and we focus on really, at a young age, engaging girls and helping them kind of just really develop their own voice. And it kind of talks about what he said, where I think it's important for people to advocate for themselves. Lots of times when you're faced with difficulties, it's very easy to give up. And I think that if we engage children as parents and as educators and mentors or whatever else, um, and just help them not take no for an answer or be able to seek out resources, be able to be confident to say, hey, I'm lacking in this area and I need it, and try and just really help them be able to identify what their needs are and be and not be afraid to speak on it. I think that's something that's very important and that would help a lot of kids get further. I'm the program manager for Concerned Black Men, Prince George's County. Um, as far as the education system, as I see it, I grew up going to Catholic school um, my entire life, um, from kindergarten to 12th grade, went to Assumption in Southeast and Archbishop Carroll. As I got older and started working with the different school systems, um, it, 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 looks, it looked like nothing that resembled education. Um, working with kids in uh, Glass Manor and Forest Heights and Oxon Hill um, and those different areas, um, the parents seem to be overwhelmed, but also the teachers are overwhelmed so you have that and then you have a, a small young man or child we work with middle school boys you have a child who's trying to learn throughout all of that um, a lot of my boys don't seem to be at base one when it comes to decision making or just having a um, an investment in education in general um, and it comes from some of their parents didn't navigate it very well and in their schools the administration isn't supporting them uh, so a lot of my guys are, are really 
uh, hands up in the air as it results uh, when it comes to education. C could you back up into something that you said that a lot of the kids you work with aren't even at base one. Does that relate to what Mr. Francis was saying that a lot of what's going on during the day, you even question whether they're even getting basic education during the course of their day. Is that what you're saying? Talking to different educators, one thing I see, um, one teacher in Southeast DC, uh, what she says is uh, in her school, there's a different initiative just about every half a year, every year. So it's like they're just starting over with these experimental mm -hmm. things and working with uh, charter schools. It really, uh, the charter schools that I've worked in, it depends on how strong the administration is and how committed they are to education. I've seen some uh, that, that uh, work very well with the kids and it seems like it's a structure that the kids can learn in. And I've seen some that look like the people are just making dollars off every kid who's sitting in their seats. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? I see a lot of people nodding their heads on this. A lot of people nodding their heads on this. You, you call in education stuff experiments, right? It's because nothing seems to work. And it's not working because it's not what's going on in school. That's the, the primary issue. You, you, we're feeding kids to, to the teachers, right, to, to raise them, to teach them manners, to teach them the subjects. And that's impossible. In years past, even in impoverished communities, much more uh, kids were coming to school with a, with a much better foundation. And we keep saying parents, but in a lot of instances that I see, especially in these communities, there's a parent. Oh, right. You know what I'm saying? And, okay. and so, again, you know, what how do we fix that and how do we solve that? In my opinion, I mean, I think it just needs to be programs aimed more at the parents than at the child. You know what I mean? Because it's like my brother spoke about in, in the District of Columbia, there's tons of programs for kids. You know what I mean? From mentoring for kids in college with their parents, the mentoring, you know, for everything, right? So my point is that you have to stabilize the parent. If a parent come home from prison, he, he or she has to be able to get a job to be able to set a certain uh, uh, um model for that kid to to be able to be an active parent to feel comfortable and confident to go in that school amongst okay. other parents and say hey i'm here to support my child we're going to walk around because i saw a lot of people wanting to talk about this whole question of feeling that there's just too much churning and not enough stability go ahead okay well now after hearing everyone speak i definitely think that one of the greatest resources is experience so to have those mentors come first of all my name is mo Bet. i'm a local artist i work with one group called will rock for food and we go to Friendship Collegiate Academy in Northeast and we talk to the kids. And I think the kids can relate because we're talking slang to them. We've gone through things like I, in high school, probably was suspended more than anyone. I graduated from a vocational school, but the reason I don't think it's the money at the school is because at this second chance school, those teachers seem to care more than they did at the bigger one. Hmm. Um, the classes were smaller, so they could interact. And like you were saying, they could talk to the kids and personally, well, you know, how is your mother doing? Is your sister doing okay? So those things, you feel like you have a friend and then that builds the confidence because my father was in jail, but I didn't feel like, okay, I have an excuse. My father's not around. You know, no one expects me to do anything. That was all the more reason why I felt I needed to succeed because I wasn't expected to. So, so you're saying, do I have this right? You're saying the complexity of choices isn't as important as the quality of the people running the programs or in the school no matter what they're offering is that how you feel right there's like I, I never wanted to discredit college i think a lot of pe college graduates get hired because if i'm an employer i'm gonna hire you because you took the initiative to go to school not necessarily that that made you any smarter or you learned any more than the next person i think like this gentleman was saying about science and math if you have the ability to learn i would rather have that person be my employee because I can teach you the job. Mm, interesting. Okay. Interesting. Sir, you have, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to participate in this? My name is Rohan Williams, and I'm a uh, college professor, and I and I also work work with youth. And one thing, there's a fallacy of choice, um, and I think the fallacy is uh, keep in mind that dropouts are probably children of dropouts. So when you present to them a lot of choices, that may not be the best thing and have a focused education. I think the gentleman over here pointed out that have an education at a very young age. And even when, before, when mothers are pregnant to have babies, you start uh, enforcing the importance of an education for their child. So when, if the child goes to school and you give someone that was a dropout themselves, here are 10 choices um, with different types of schools. I mean, they, they will be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So I think there's this fallacy that if we give enough choice in the system, that's gonna fix everything. But it's like, uh, like healthcare, for instance, if I give you 38 choices, you're probably gonna end up not picking any. 
Um, and I think it's so it's very important to have a very simple focus educational system and also support parents at a very, very young age before their kids are born, even in the hospital, to help them grow up and understand the importance of education and then develop the, this knowledge of the choices as they get older. We actually have a graphic of the top four issues that have been discussed thus far. Our uh, WHU team has been doing their homework while we've been talking out here. Uh, these are the issues that we've talked about so far. Lack of parental involvement, teaching techniques not engaging, uh, overcrowded classrooms, um, lack of mentorship. I don't know if that is overcrowded. Does that overcrowded classroom sound right to you? I'm thinking, uh, does that sound right? Just over, j just, just not well resourced, busted, busted classrooms, right? Busted up, right? Okay. So now that we've talked about, does that, does that, first of all, let me just, before we, let me just do a check in. Does this sound right? Do you feel like we've gotten kind of the gist of the things that we wanted to talk about? Okay, how about insufficient resources? Does that work? Does that work better? Does that work better? Okay, viable education. Could we just could we just assume that that's what that means? Could we just agree? Okay, all right. <laughs> so now that we've kind of identified some of the major issues, we want to talk about ways to address them. I promise that that's what we were going to do, and I want to hear about ideas or examples of programs, services. Some people have talked about that can improve the schools and the ability to not just graduate, but graduate on time. And I know some of you have already started talking about some of those issues. So I would love to, I'm not discriminating, but I would love to hear from somebody who hasn't had a chance to participate. So this lady here and this gentleman here. That's okay. okay. I think one of the things that we haven't addressed fully is how we're preparing our teachers for urban classrooms. Um, I'm with Urban Teacher Center, but at the I think one of the pieces we don't think about is how do we continue to support teachers? How do we train teachers? Um, how do we ensure that they're getting the development that they need? You know, how do we ensure that teachers in urban environments are able to work with parents? How are they getting that training? And we okay, think so you of run this, the world right now. What does it look like? So I run the world. Right, I would train the right teachers now. What does it look the same like? way that we train doctors or lawyers. I would make it a competitive. It's a very competitive profession, but but I would continue to support. I would continue to provide coaches. I mean, if we really think about the impact of a teacher, and we know that an effective teacher can improve their classroom's net earnings in the millions of dollars being well prepared, I think we would focus on this very differently. So I would have teacher coaches all the time. I would make this one of the most competitive professions, and I would think of teaching as at the same you know level of esteem that you would pursue being a doctor or being a lawyer, you know? And I think that's definitely one of the ways I would start to change the profession. If we the really focused thing, on huh? that, okay, maybe, maybe yeah. it's DC. But I think if we really focused on that, we would see a change. Sounds um, like Finland. I mean, it sounds like Finland. I mean, there are countries, particularly, I think, um, I think Northern Europe where teaching is extremely competitive. I don't know, how does that, other thoughts? I'm interested in how other people react to that, sir. Um, I just wanted to quickly discuss the lack of mentorship uh, issue. I think that uh, hearing the gentleman talk about um, going to college and not being able to, uh, you know, getting to a point where he felt like he may have reached the glass ceiling, I think part of overcoming that is seeing people who have done it before and seeing them at an early age. Um, I didn't say it, but my name is Terrence Clegg. I'm from uh, Concerned Black Men here in D.C., and we run a mentoring initiative. And one of the things that I was concerned about a few weeks ago, um, I came in and I mentioned the name Jordan Davis, and none of the kids knew who that was. I mentioned the name Michael Dunn, none of the kids knew who that was. But if you mention Shy Glizzy, if you mention Chief Keith, if you mention um, all of the rappers that are out there, they know exactly who those kids are. And that's because those are the role models that they see. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to reach out to those people who have made it and who have made it the right way and make sure that they meet those kids on that crossroads so that when they get there, they can go the right way instead of you know seeing, seeing the role models they're accustomed to. Hmm. Okay, other thoughts about this, ma'am? This lady is gonna come to you and meet you with the mic. We were talking about a secret sauce before <laughs> and I work on a program called AARP Experience Corps and we bring older adult tutors into the classrooms to work with kindergarten through third grade children, the importance of having children succeed and read proficiently by the end of third grade has been well researched. Um, and, and that's, you know, the literacy piece is, is a large part of what we do, but most importantly, you know, we are providing those positive role models for children, and I think our secret sauce our older adults coming into the classroom, people who have achieved, people who have the experience, people who have the wisdom. And I think in every community, we have older adults who can do that, who can support the children. I would love to hear 
you know, your thoughts about what you've heard so far. I mean, I am particularly interested in what keeps you interested in school and uh, what turns you off. I mean, I think that would be helpful. You can tell me um, whatever you want to tell okay, me. Okay, so I came from a background. My, my dad didn't graduate from high school. My mom didn't receive a higher education. However, even though they didn't, they couldn't help me with my math homework, they couldn't tell me the X plus Y equals Z, they provided me with support. And so it is important for the parents to be involved, but at the same time, because my parents provided me with that support, I graduated in the top percent of my high school. But because I was one of the, I went to a predominantly white high school, because I was one of the only African American students in my class, I received priority because I was grouped with those top students, but I had friends that were, not below me, but not on the same level as me, and they didn't receive that same attention. So I believe that there should be a balance between parents and school. Responsibility shouldn't fall heavily on one or the other. Just because other, I know a lot of people were saying that they came from bad backgrounds and their parents were in and out of prison and all sorts of things, but if the support can't come from the parents, then the school really should try to support them in some other way with, with the after school programs and everything else that Wh we were talking about. Why should they? Why should they? Because the school's job is to produce leaders, to produce people that will make a difference in this world at the end of the day, not just to give me a grade so I can go on and get out and say that I did this and that. It's to inspire me. So people often limit the school to just educating, but not inspiring. Um, inspiring. Anybody else? Any other thoughts? May I? Okay, I wait for the mic, please, if you would. Thanks. Interested in hearing about the woman who was talking about professional development and training teachers. Um, I I do think that teachers need a lot of help. Um, you know, deciphering uh, the new standards that have come out and finding good resources for those new stand uh, for the new standards. Um, one thing that we do have, fortunately, in Washington D.C. is the Kennedy Center who has the uh, Changing Education Through the Arts program. And they do send coaches out to schools. And these are great programs for any style of learning, especially children who have ADD or ADHD, autistic children, children who have a different learning style and they need more kinesthetic type movement. And so this is for people, is this specifically arts-based learning or is this to it is. introduce arts no, into it is all curricula? It's okay. a, a whole arts integration. Yeah, can I ask you a question? Do you mm -hmm. mind if I put you on the spot as an educator? Do you feel it's a sign of weakness if you ask for help? Or is it, a, well, is it something I don't. that's looked down <laughs> on? If, if you ask for help, are, is it seen as you can't do your job? I think that a lot of teachers do feel that pressure that, oh, I can't ask anyone, you know, I, I can't come forward and say, I, I don't know how to do this. I can't come forward and say, what is this on the report card? I mean, you know, you talk about engaging parents. If we could have a report card that parents understood, maybe <laughs> that would help bridge that gap between teachers and parents. But I do think that, you know, you, you have to just put yourself out there and say, what is this standard? You know, it's a little bit different than the old one, but how are we going to address this? And you have to do that in collaboration. And I think collaboration is a really important part, and I think that administrators really have to support that with their teachers. Other thoughts? I, I, I really want to come back to some point that you had made earlier in, in, the, in our conversation. It really is one of the first points that was made about how some kids want to be beauticians they want to work on cars they want to and we're not necessarily serving mm -hmm. those kids and so can you talk a little bit more about what you were saying and i also want to know what does the world according to you look like how would you oh, wow. fix it what would you do differently now the the thing about what the kids want to do speaks to that um, critical thinking piece um, where i feel that at least in the african-american community i've seen parents and it, the teachers uh, authority figures squash these students, they don't, maybe. Which students? African American students. Across the board, not just if they want to okay. do some aspiration or another, but just. I like to crush paint their with names. a wide brush, mm -hmm. but you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they may get some critical thinking, teaching, or skills learning in a classroom, but get outside that classroom and you have an idea, you want to present it to the principal or somebody, no. I won't, they won't listen to you. Student government, uh uh, no. 
Why no are you fair. pointing? I, I personally see it as um, insecurities, uh, lack of control on the adults' parts. Don't give the students, don't give them that much. Don't give them, you know, f why? What are you afraid of? That they might be great? Uh, you know, I, I had a different experience where I, I saw 19-year-olds running um, a, a college uh, alumni camp. They're teaching professors and very re well-known, renowned people how to do things, t telling them what to do. And the people are like, okay, we'll do it. 19-year-olds. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, why doesn't that happen in our community? Why not? But yeah. Does that, does that resonate with others? Do other people feel that way? It resonates with you? It resonates with you? Go ahead, Mary. Thank you. I mm -hmm. didn't give my name earlier. I'm Harriet Frost, and I'm a librarian in DCPS. And I also want to reiterate that critical thinking will only come if students are encouraged to read more. They have to read more. We do have a like of reading mentality now that exists. So that's the way they're going to critically think, by reading. That is the first time we've had applause all evening. It's about reading. We could have started there. <laughs> Can I go back to something, Tony, that you said early in our conversation? This also came up on the survey that many of you filled out before you, we started our conversation, which is the whole peer, peer pressure thing. I know you phrased it differently, but that a lot of students feel peer pressure. They feel that to, I, I guess, how would you describe it? To not pursue education, to not take their studies seriously. And if you don't have that, and that kind of loops back to your point, because if you don't have parents or family pushing you in the opposite direction, then that really becomes difficult. Did you feel that way? Absolutely right. I mean, if you don't have the parents or somebody to push you, I mean, you growing up in communities like the one I come from where in your high school years, your friends are dying, your other friends are having kids. Like these are all the things that's outside of school that's stopping people from going to school as well. Like you, you're not going to school because you beefing at school, right? Your your rivals go to school with you, or you can get shot on the way home. So, those are other. And so you don't have somebody at home that's pushing you. It's so easy to kind of get sidetracked. And I think, um, I mean, not just in D.C., Chicago, L.A., New York, wherever. <laughs> This is what's happening, and and, and so I'm I mean, interested in your thought. Though you said you were very specific, because we're going to talk about solutions for the rest of the program. Sure. You were very clear about what you think needs to happen, and that is you saying that it's like we put a lot of emphasis on kids' programs, but we really need to renew our emphasis on shoring up the family. What would that look like? Um, well, I, I think uh, re access to resources that produces or oh, that get parents into training and educational programs that will lead to them being gainfully employed. I think that's like primary. I think also um, when we talked about mentoring for kids, we, I think we need parental mentors. We need parents that can be able to show other parents how to access resources for their kids, mm -hmm. whether it be educational or just uh, social programming. Um, I think that's very necessary. Um, the brother spoke about something. I think that peer-to-peer -peer with children is great, but we need peer-to-peer -peer mentors for parents. Um, that's in their age and, and, and because I, I, I really say I'm 33 and I think, um, I don't know if they call us Gen Y or something, moving on, we really deal with a set of issues that the generations before has never dealt with. So it's hard, just because you're older, I, it's hard for sometimes for us to look and get advised correctly. We need people that's within our age bracket that did things to mm -hmm. come back and talk and show. Interesting. So. Has anybody ever participated in that parent education? Does that, any experience with that? Does that? Have you, sir? My name is Tracy Brower. I used to run a mentoring program in D.C. for ninth grade boys, and we had a parent component where we brought in the parents every Saturday to provide them with resources and information, specifically how to raise a young man. And we talked about that, you know, what does it mean to raise a young man in your household who's 14, who's getting on your nerves, who's growing up to become, you know. And I, used to, I tell parents, we do get better, you know, 14, 15, get past that. But we provide that information about what resources they need in the schools as well, how to, ex ex how to um, access. To access excuse me. How did it work? It went well. The parents, um, those gra those students, um, all graduated high school. The students and the parents were able. They they formed their own bond. They were able to mentor each other, as you said. They could teach each other. Um, one thing I do also, I teach students about college access and the financial aid pro process. It's better if I have a parent talk about the financial aid pro process as opposed to me. The, I'm, I'm the professional, but the parents been through it. They had to actually sit down at the computer, fill out the information as well. Another parent tell them it can be done. So. You need parents, like you said, parents can be, they can coach each other and they can also be the leaders to facilitate. We, as the professionals and the experts, we don't always have to be the, um, be the ones to provide the information. Let the parents provide the information to their peer groups. Let me do a quick check-in. Thank you for that. Let me do a quick check-in. Um, 
recapping some of the things that we've talked about so far, some of the ideas that have been presented so far. Um, this is the graphic here, improve teacher training and development, support programs for parents, better, more engaging subject matter or curricula, improvement of education oversight. Does that resonate? Do we feel like we're getting some of our ideas uh, captured here? So it looks like our time has come to an end. We'd like to thank our studio audience for joining us and sharing their thoughts and ideas on how to tackle the dropout crisis in our area. We'd also like to thank the Corporation for Public Broadcasting as well as our local partners, the Boys and Girls Club of Washington, Concerned Black Men National, DC Children and Youth Investment Trust, Gap Busters, Girls Inc., Turning the Page. And most importantly, we want to thank you, our viewing audience, for joining us for this important conversation. To learn more about this program, WHUT's efforts in support of the American Graduate Initiative, as well as information about WHUT's other programs and services, please go to www.whut.org while you are there. We'd love to get your feedback about this program. I'm Michelle Martin. It's been a pleasure spending this time with you. We hope you'll keep watching here on WHUT. Good night. This program is part of American Graduate, Let's Make It Happen, a public media initiative made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.